right, if you would open your Bibles to Haggai in chapter 2. Haggai in chapter number 2. That's the Old Testament, Gabby. If you go to the last book of Old Testament and go two books back, you'll find it. She's ignoring me, like most teenagers do. But Haggai in chapter 2, once you find your place there, I invite you to stand in honor of reading God's word. Haggai chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 20. Um, this, will be, this will conclude our uh, study in Haggai. And uh, we, was four, we spent about four messages in, in, these two, in these two chapters. Haggai chapter 2, verse 20 says, And again, the word of the Lord came unto Haggai in the four and twentieth day of the month, saying, So this is the exact same time of the day the previous, uh, that the previous prophecy was uh, on. Said, verse 21, Speak to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms, and I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen, and I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them, and the horses and the riders shall come down every one by the sword of his brother. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, I will take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtel, saith the Lord, and will make thee a signet, for I have chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. Father, as we are to the preaching and the teaching part of the service, Father, once again, I ask that you would empty me of myself, Father, that you would cleanse me of my sin, and that you would fill me with thine Holy Ghost, that I may preach thus, saith the word of the Lord. Father, I ask this evening that you would help us to see, Lord, maybe what they didn't see, Lord, in, in this time, that Zerubbabel didn't quite see. Lord, we just want to thank you for what you have in your word. Lord, we ask that you would help us to apply it to our life. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. Ask God to bless the reading of His Word. Speak to you this evening on the subject of the big picture. The big picture. If you remember, last time we were in Zechariah, or not Zechariah, but Haggai, we were talking about how that the people were disappointed in their the reaping of the harvest. Now, we talked about the last time we were in here in Haggai that they were, when they sowed the seed, uh, they were sowing when they were in disobedience to God and not building the temple. They weren't doing what they were supposed to do. They laid the foundation, and they just sat it there while they did their own things, right? And so now, then they had the, uh, three months later, they were reaping the harvest, and they had already, and they had came to their senses and, and was obedient to God and started building the temple, and they went to measure the harvest to see what they were going to get, and they found out that they were not going to get what they sown, and, and they had to be reminded that they sown uh, those seed in the har uh, for the harvest when they were in disobedience, and they are reaping the consequences of their sin. Remember that? And so now, at the end, God has a message here, for one person, now he's not, a, when God uses Haggai to speak, he's not sending a message to the people, but to one person. Zerubbabel. God has a message for Zerubbabel and him alone. And so God's message to Zerubbabel is God tells Zerubbabel that he holds the future. If we look here, he says in verse 21, speak to Zerubbabel. The governor of Judah saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth and I will overthrow the throne of the kingdoms and I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen and I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride in them and the horses and the riders shall come down everyone by the sword of his brother. Now think about this. They're, they've measured their harvest and they're disappointed. 
So who are they going to go to? The leader, right? When things aren't working out, maybe the way you think, you're going to go to the leader, and you're going to say, well, what's, what's the deal? And so Zerubbabel, you know, he, you know, he's been uh, put in charge to help lead the people, right? And so uh, there, you can imagine maybe his disappointment too. Maybe he's a little, a little disappointed in what's going on. And so God is sending a message to him through the prophet Haggai saying, and if you look at this with the message, what Haggai says is, God is telling Zerubbabel, I still hold the future, son. You may be disappointed right now, but I'm still in charge. Notice the I wills that God here has, sets out. If you look at each one of them, we're going to see what God has planned for the future. Now, if just casually reading, you're going to say, okay, well, what does that mean? But we have a future here that God is speaking of, and we see it says here that at the end of verse 20, it says, I will shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow the, the throne of kingdoms, and I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen, and I will overthrow the chariots and we see all these I wills I will shake the heavens I will overthrow the throne of the kingdom see we see here that God is saying listen in the future even though right now uh, that Israel's in their land do you still think that they get to control everything now who's controlling them right here the Medes and the Persians right and after that Greeks and then Romans Listen, even now to this date, even, they, even though they, they were made a state in the four, uh, 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 an official state in the 40s, right, the, they could go through their land, do they still get to do what they want, how they want? No, they're still controlled by international law. People of the U.N., God-forsaken place, should, uh, needs to be gone, but that's neither here nor there. It tells them what they can and can't do, how they must obey this that law and that law, and they can't do that. So... And so God is telling Serpo, in the future, listen, no one is going to be able to, to, ta to handle you militarily. He says, I'm going to throw down, the, I'm going to cast down the kingdoms. He's talking about there's not, going to be a poli there's not going to be any politics involved in the future. And he says, he says oh, I'm also going to take down the chariots, right, and those who rode on. He said, there's not going to be a military power that's going to be able to overthrow you. Now, if you're thinking, now your mind should have skipped on ahead to what? Millennial kingdom, right? And so, Zerubbabel uh, can't see this. He's got the, uh, this message from Haggai to Zerubbabel and think about, well, what do you mean that this is what's going to happen? Well, God is talking future tense, right? And so, the, the work that God is doing is a work that only God himself can do and not Zerubbabel can do. Because, listen, they, they, they've just returned back to their land, and there's no way Israel can do that. And so God is, is telling him, this is a work that I'm going to do. If you go to Zechariah chapter, uh, what is it, 4, verse 6, he says, not by power, not by might, but by my what? Spirit, saith the Lord. So God is telling Zerubbabel, by prophet Haggai, listen, I'm doing this work. This is nothing that you can do or no man can do, but that he is going to do. And so, and one day there will not be any political power or to determine what Israel and they cannot do. So, one day Jesus will come onto this earth and he will overthrow those kingdoms, right? And politics and military. One day he's going to come to this this earth isn't he people been they say well you've been saying that for a long time well he, listen he's gonna just because it's been said for a long time doesn't make it doesn't cease for it to be true let's go to daniel real quick turn to daniel chapter 2 daniel and chapter 2 
give me a moment. Daniel chapter 2, look at verse 34. We're going to see what's going on. Remember Nebuchadnezzar and the dream he had? Right, Daniel chapter 2, verse 34. We're, we're talking about, the, about it. It says here that thou sawest, um, yeah, Jan Daniel chapter 2. Uh, it says in the, talk, in the verse, previous verses, verses 31 through 33, describes the image. And then here we see Daniel says, Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Verse 35, Then was the iron, the, cl the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them, and, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So we see in verses 31 through 33 describing this image, and what did each image represent? A kingdom. I don't have to go back and do all this backstory through the book of Daniel, but if you look, every image, the head, of, the head was who? Nebuchadnezzar, the gold, the greatest kingdom. Then you have the different parts of the statue talking about different kingdoms. And if you look at verses 34 and 35 talking about this stone that was cut, wasn't even made, out, made by anybody out of hands, it was, threw, it was thrown at the base of this, of this statue, and it just fell apart. That stone that was made, that was cut without hands, is who? Jesus Christ. So we see here in uh, this message to Zerubbabel is what God has said in Daniel was going to happen about Jesus, that there's not going to be a kingdom to stand that will be able to stand and go up against Jesus uh, when he is ruling and reigning on this earth. And so that day uh, is when the Gentiles will end. When Jesus steps foot on this earth and begins to reign, we have Armageddon. We're going to go to uh, we're going to go to Revelation here in a minute. But when when he when he steps forth on this earth, the age of the Gentiles, the church age, is gone. It's over and becomes the millennial kingdom, the millennial reign when G, when Jesus Christ is here. And so we see that he will reign. So in Revelation chapter sixteen, turn there. In Revelation in chapter number 16, and we'll see about this when Jesus comes on the scene. Revelation in chapter 16, verse 16. Revelation 16, 16, we'll see here, and, and he gathered them together into one place called in the Hebrew tongue, um, again, this is where all the kingdoms come together to go to battle with Jesus, right? And the seventh, or, and the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. Uh, oh, we're going to go all the way to verse 21. And there uh, was voice, voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty, an earthquake, and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in, and remembers there before God, to give unto her the cup of the wine and uh, of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and there fell upon men a great hell out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague and the hell, for the plague there, uh, thereof was exceedingly great. So we see what we, what's going on, where the stone was cast at the kingdoms, and they all fell apart. Listen, one day uh, we're going to be on that mount watching what's going on. And there's not going to be a political party, no kingdom, no anywhere that will be able to stand and go against Jesus is, is what it says. He's going to throw it at the base of those kingdoms. You saw the island? Gone. Listen, it doesn't matter what New York City says, we'll say, if it's even around. And I will tell you this, it ain't going to matter what 
little person is in the White House and what they say. They're going to battle, they're going to, they, the, those even if America's still around at that time, will come with those kingdoms to do battle against Jesus. Yes, I know we have a, 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 a we love America, right? And we have some, which is not a bad thing to have a love for your country, but yes, America will come against Jesus. This is why we don't hold dear to any political party as believers. We don't hold, put all of our eggs in one basket to a political party as believers. I'm sorry, but the Republicans are not God's only party. Okay, and so we see this battle of Armageddon going to happen, uh, that Jesus, uh, none, none of these kingdoms are going to be able to stand. Now go to Revelation chapter 19 and look at verse 11. 19 verse 11, it says this, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon it was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he that judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, uh, flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he, had, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called what? The Word of God. And the, the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth, uh, mouth goeth a sharp sword, and, uh, sharp sword, that with it he should with a rod of, or smite the nations, and he shall roll them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress, of the fierceness and with uh, and wrath of Almighty God, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So we see this is the this is the message that God through Haggai is telling Zerubbabel. Listen, one day Jesus, no no longer no other Gentile will rule you, but a Jew will rule the earth. Nobody's going to be able to come upon you anymore and tell you what you can and can't do, for the Messiah will come back onto this earth and rule and reign, and the armies of God will follow. What a day that's going to be. We ain't got to worry about paying money across this world for murdering babies. We're not going to have to worry about what, uh, what silly, stupid politics this side or this side argue about. We're going to have one king over the entire world, and it will be Jesus. And so we see this message. Listen, Zerubbabel, I hold the future. It's not up to what you do or what, how you, what kind of thing you can do for Israel. I'm in charge here. He says, not only am I in charge of the future, but listen, I've got a, a message for just you, yourself. Look at what, how uh, God, in, his encouragement to Zerubbabel. We're going to go back to Haggai. We see God's encouragement to Zerubbabel. Verse, 20, uh, verse 23, it says, And in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, I will take thee, O Zerubbabel, my... Look, at, he addressed him first as what? Governor. Now what? Servant. He says, he goes, you know what, Zerubbabel, verse 23? Servant, the son of Shealtel, saith the Lord, and will make thee a signet. For I have what? Chosen thee. God is making Zerubbabel a signet. Do you know what a signet is? That's the thing that the kings would wear around their neck to, sign, to do their signature with. You're talking about maybe a ring or something that they would, when they would seal a letter, put that hot wax and do the saying that's from the king. Well, this is what Zerubbabel is going to be. God is going to restore the Davidic covenant line that he took away in Jeremiah's day. Listen, Zerubbabel's great-grandfather ruined it. God took that away from his great Grandfather, we're going to see uh, his, his, the name in Jeremiah, Jeremiah's day. In Zerubbabel, God says, what I'm going to do, I'm going to put you back in line. Because if we go to Matthew chapter 1, look at Matthew chapter 1. 
we're going to see God coming through with this on his promise. Does God, uh, does God always come through on his promises? You better believe he does. So Matthew uh, chapter 1, verse 12, we'll see here. It says, and after, uh, it says they were, Matthew chapter 1, verse 12, and after they were brought uh, to Babylon, Jacoinus, that's the one who God took out. You go back to Jeremiah, you'll see that God said, you've been disobedient, and took him out of the line and said, he's not going to be on the throne anymore. But what, uh, Babylon, uh, uh, Jacoinus begot Selethio, and Selethio begot, who's that? Zerubbabel. God restored the Davidic, the, the Davidic line with Zerubbabel because of his what? Why did God tell Zerubbabel, I'm going to make you a signet, I'm going to put you back in the Davidic line, great-grandpa to who? Jesus. Or great-great-grandpa to Jesus. Why did God do that? I'll give you one hint. It's with one word that begins with the letter O. Obedience. Obedience. Why did God, what did he say? What did, what did, what did Zerubbabel do when Haggai gave him the message? He was obedient. Well, what, what can obedience do for you? There's no greater blessing that Zerubbabel could have than being the line of the Messiah. His great-grandpa got out of the line because of his disobedience. And because of Zerubbabel's obedience, he's in the back in the line of the Davidic kingdom for the Davidic line for the Messiah. There's a bigger picture out there. There's more than, listen folks, there is more going on in this world right now than what we see with our bitty eyes in Washington. We talk about every new president is, is and it's all on the line. It's all or nothing. Or we see God, the prophecy come. We, listen, we've been seeing prophecy come along ever since the 40s. We know the only thing that's left is what? The rapture. But God is getting everything in line for what's happening after the tribulation. Now, do I know when that's going to happen? No, I don't. I'd be a fool to try to say that I know when the rapture and when the tribulation is going to happen. As Zerubbabel couldn't figure out what's going on, what, what was going on in his day with what's go, what God's going to do. Can't figure out what, what, how you're going to make me a signet and all that, but we see what's been prophesied before in Daniel, what John sees in, the revel, in Revelation. It's tied together. There's a bigger picture. And since there's a bigger picture, obedience is to be, needs to be found in the life of a believer. Well, Brother Mark, do you think that the election was stolen? Does that really matter in the big scheme of things? It might give us a little displeasure it could even listen it could even cause some tribulation right of what's going on in our little country but god is gearing up for something a lot bigger he is preparing this world for his son to come down and rule and reign in the sitting there studying this and go reading this and studying this, I'm like, there's always more than what casual reading can give you. And so, obedience, because of, uh, but just because of Zerubbabel's obedience, what a blessing he gets. We can't just look at what's going on in front of us, but we've got to look at the bigger picture. What we're doing now what are we supposed to be doing? Getting ready for what? 
the rapture, right? Becoming Superman and Superwoman and flying out of here, right? Becoming, we're, we're getting ready for the rapture. And, and, get, and making things ready for Jesus to come after the tribulation to roll into rain. It's time we get our eyes and ears off of this little bitty spot in our country in the Northeast named Washington, D.C., and get our eyes and ears back in this book. Well, Mark, it's, well, Mark, it's important. Yes, I understand it's important. But beware where your loyalties lie. Does your loyalty lie with this country or does it lie with your Savior? You can do both as long as Jesus. You can have some loyalty to your, to your America, can't you? Brother Roy is like, yeah, I serve this country. I love, you know, Brother Roy bled for this country. Loves this country. We can love our country. We can be loyal to our country as long as America, our loyalty to America does not outweigh our loyalty to our Savior. Are we getting, so let's, let's turn off the news channel all it does is make you mad. And all it does is make you mad. Let's turn on the Bible. Let's turn on, I'd say the spiritual channel, but that's cheesy. TBN is not the spiritual channel. Let's turn on God. Let's be aware of what's going on. But let's look at the bigger picture. So what's going on in Washington should motivate you and I. Should motivate you and I to share the gospel even more. It should cause us to share the gospel even more. It should cause us to be more faithful to the gospel even more. Listen, we ain't never outgrow the gospel. You never do. All we do is grow deeper into it. So are you looking at the bigger picture or are you looking at the small picture, whatever size you have on your wall or on your TV stand? Something greater is going on. And so where does your loyalty lie? Where does it lie? Father, as we conclude this evening, Lord, as we see, or as you show us a rubble, there's a bigger picture or in his life and what you're doing with Israel, or there's a bigger picture in our life in what you're doing in our little country. Father, we are looking forward to the day where Jesus rules and reigns, where righteousness is the rule, where we don't have to worry about the wickedness of this nation or that nation. Father, but that Jesus is on the throne. Or we know he's on the throne now. Lord in heaven. And that's such a great and wonderful thing that he is still in control. Or but that day when he reigns here on earth, what a day that will be. Lord, I pray that we, as the Garthwood Baptist Church, we would look at the bigger picture. Lord, that our loyalty is not with just a country, Lord, but with the Savior. Lord, if there's someone here this evening, or maybe they have misplaced their loyalties, maybe they have misplaced their priorities, or that they would see there's something greater going on. Lord, and they would settle it in their heart, they would get back on board, and they would pay attention to what you're doing and get involved and what you're doing. Lord, you put us here on this earth to seek and to say, to reach those that are lost so that you can save. That's what Jesus said. I come to seek and to save that which is lost. 
Lord, help us as a church to seek those out that are lost and to point them back to Jesus and have our eye on the bigger picture. Lord, thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you for your word and what we have in your word. Now may we apply it to our life. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.